Max and Maurice by William Bush. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Max and Maurice A Juvenile History in Seven Tricks by William Bush. Ah, uh, how oft we read or hear of boys we almost stand in fear of. For example, take these stories of two youths, Max and Maurice, who, instead of early turning their young minds to useful learning, often leered with horrid features at their lessons and their teachers. Look now at the empty head. He is for mischief always ready, teasing creatures, climbing fences, stealing apples, pears, and quinces, is, of course, a deal more pleasant, and far easier for the present, than to sit in schools or churches, fix like roosters on their perches. But, oh dear, oh dear, oh dearie, when the end comes sad and dreary, tis a dreadful thing to tell that on Max and Maurice fell. All they did this book rehearses, both in pictures and in verses. Trick First To most people who have leisure, raising poultry gives us pleasure. First, because the eggs they lay us, for the care we take, repay us. Secondly, that now and then we can dine on roasted hen. Thirdly, of the hens and goose's feathers, men make various uses. Some folks like to rest their heads in the night on feather beds. One of these was Widow Tibbets, whom the cut you see exhibits. Hens were hers in number three, and a cock of majesty. Max and Maurice took a view, fell to thinking what to do. One, two, three, as soon as said, they have sliced a loaf of bread, cut each piece again in four, each a finger thick, no more. These to two cross threads they tie, like a letter X they lie, in the widow's yard, with care stretched by those two rascals there. Scarce the cock had seen the sight, when he up and crew with might, Cock, a doodle, doodle, do, Tack, 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 the trio flew. Cock and hens, like fowls unfed, Gobbled each a piece of bread. But they found, on taking thought, Each of them was badly caught. Every way they pull and twitch, This strange cat's cradle to unhitch, up into the air they fly, Jiminy, O oh Gemini. On a tree behold them dangling, In the agony of strangling, And their necks grow long and longer, And their groans grow strong and stronger. Each lays quickly one egg more, Then they cross to the other shore. Widow Tibbets in her chamber by these death cries waked from slumber rushes out with bodeful thought heavens what sight her vision caught from her eyes the tears are streaming oh my dears my toil my dreaming ah life's fairest hope says she hangs upon that apple tree heart sick you may well suppose, for the carving knife she goes, cuts the bodies from the bough, hanging cold and lifeless now, and in silence, bathed in tears, through her house door disappears. This was the bad boy's first trick, but the second follows quick. Trick Second when the worthy widow Tibbets, whom the cut below exhibits, had recovered, on the morrow, 
from the dreadful shock of sorrow, she, as soon as grief would let her think, began to think twere better just to take the dead, the dear ones who in life were walking here once, and in a still noonday hour them well roasted to devour. True, it did seem almost wicked when they lay so bare and naked, picked and singed before the blaze, they that once in happier days in the yard or garden ground all day long went scratching round. Ah, Frau Tibbets wept anew, and poor Spitz was with her too. Max and Maurice smelled the savour, climbed the roof, cried each young shaver, through the chimney now with pleasure they behold the tempting treasure, headless in the pan there lying, hissing, browning, steaming, frying. At that moment, down the cellar, dreaming not what soon befell her, widow Tibbets went for sour kraut, which she would oft devour with exceeding great desire, warmed a little at the fire. Up there on the roof, meanwhile, they are doing things in style. Max already, with forethought, a long fishing line has brought. Schnup de wup there goes, oh, Jiminy, one hen dangling up the chimney. Schnup de wup a second bird. Schnup de wup up comes the third. Presto, number four they haul. Schnup de wup we have them all. Spitz looks on, we must allow, but he barks. Row, 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 row. But the rogues are down instanter from the roof, and off they canter. Ha! I guess there'll be a humming. Here's the widow Tibbets coming. Rooted stood she to the spot, when the pan her vision caught. Gone was every blessed bird. Horrid spitz was her first word. Oh, you spitz, you monster, you. Let me beat you black and blue. And the heavy ladle thwack comes down on poor spitz's back. Loud he yells with agony, for he feels his conscience free. Max and Maurice, dinner over, in a hedge snored under cover. And of that great hen feast now, each has but a leg to show. This was now the second trick, but the third will follow quick. Trick third. Through the town and country round was one Mr. Buck renowned. Sunday coats and weekday sack coats, bobtails, swallowtails, and frock coats, gaiters, breeches, hunting jackets, waistcoats with commodious pockets, and other things too long to mention, claimed Mr. Taylor Buck's attention. Or, if anything wanted doing in the way of darning, sewing, piecing, patching, if a button needed to be fixed or put on, anything of any kind, anywhere, before, behind, Master Buck could do the same, for it was his life's great aim. Therefore, all the population held him high in estimation. Max and Maurice tried to invent ways to plague this worthy gent. Right before the Sartor's dwelling ran a swift stream, roaring, swelling. This swift stream a bridge did span, and the road across it ran. Max and Maurice, naught could all them, took a saw when no one saw them, ritzy ratsy riddle riddle, sawed a gap across the middle. When this feat was finished well, suddenly was heard a yell. Hello there, come out, you buck. Taylor, Taylor, muck, muck, muck. Buck could hear all sorts of jeering, jibes and jokes in silence hearing. 
but this insult roused such anger nature couldn't stand it longer wild with fury up he started with his yardstick out he darted for once more that frightful jeer muck 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 rang loud and clear on the bridge one leap he makes crash beneath his weight it breaks once more rings the cry muck muck in head foremost plumps poor buck while the scared boys were skedaddling down the brook two geese came paddling on the legs of these two geese with a death clutch buck did seize and with both geese well in hand flutters out upon dry land for the rest he did not find things exactly to his mind soon it proved poor buck had brought a dreadful bellyache from the water noble mrs buck she rises fully equal to the crisis with a hot flat iron she draws the cold out famously soon twas in the mouths of men all through the town bucks up again this was the bad boy's third trick but the fourth will follow quick trick fourth an old saw runs somewhat so man must learn while here below not alone the a b c raises man in dignity not alone in reading writing reason finds a work inviting not alone to solve the double rule of three shall man take trouble but must hear with pleasure sages teach the wisdom of the ages of this wisdom an example to the world was master lample for this cause to max and maurice this man was the chief of horrors for a boy who loves bad tricks wisdom's friendship never seeks with the clerical profession smoking always was a passion and this habit without question while it helps promote digestion is a comfort no one can well begrudge a good old man when the day's vexations close and he sits to seek repose max and maurice flinty hearted on another trick have started thinking how they may attack a poor old man through his tobacco once when sunday morning breaking pious hearts to gladness waking poured its light where in the temple at his organ sate ere lample these bad boys for mischief ready stole into the good man's study where his darling meerschaum stands this max holds in both his hands while young maurice scapegrace born climbs and gets the powder horn and with speed the wicked soul pours the powder in the bowl hush and quick now right about for already church is out lample closes the church door glad to seek his home once more all his service well got through take his keys and music too and his way delighted wends homeward to his silent friends full of gratitude he there lights his pipe and takes his chair ah he says no joy is found like contentment on earth's round fizz whiz bum the pipe is burst almost shattered into dust coffee pot and water jug snuff box ink stand tumbler mug table stove and easy chair all are flying through the air in a lightning powder flash with a most tremendous crash when the smoke cloud lifts and clears lample on his back appears god be praised still breathing there only somewhat worse for wear 
nose, hands, eyebrows, once like yours, now are black as any moors, burned the last thin spear of hair, and his pate is wholly bare. Who shall now the children guide, lead their steps to wisdom's side? Who shall now, for Master Lample, lead the service in the temple? Now that his old pipe is out, shattered, smashed, gone up the spout, time will heal the rest once more, but the pipe's best days are o'er. This was the bad boy's fourth trick, but the fifth will follow quick. Trick fifth. If in village or in town you've an uncle settled down, always treat him courteously. Uncle will be pleased thereby. In the morning, morning to you. Any errand I can do you? Fetch whatever he may need, pipe to smoke, and news to read. Or should some confounded thing prick his back, or bite, or sting, nephew then will be nearby, ready to his help, to fly, or a pinch of snuff, maybe. Sets him sneezing violently. Prosit, uncle, good health to you, God be praised, much good may it do you. Or he comes home late, perchance, Pull his boots off, then at once. Fetch his slippers, and his cap, And warm gown his limbs to wrap. Be your constant care, good boy, What shall give your uncle joy? Max and Maurice, need I mention, Had not any such intention. See now how they tried their wits, These bad boys on Uncle Fritz. What kind of a bird a may-bug was, they knew, I dare say. In the trees they may be found, flying, crawling, wriggling round. Max and Maurice, great pains taking, from a tree these bugs are shaking. In their cornucopia papers they collect these pinching creepers. Soon they are deposited. In the foot of uncle's bed. With his peaked nightcap on, Uncle Fritz to bed has gone, Tucks the clothes in, shuts his eyes, And in sweetest slumber lies. Critz, cracks, come the charters, Single file from their night quarters, And the captain boldly goes, Straight at Uncle Fritzy's nose. Bah! he cries. What have we here? Seizing that grim grenadier. Uncle, wild with fright, upspringeth, And the bedclothes from him flingeth. Och! He seizes two more scapegraces From his shin and nape. Crawling, flying to and fro, Round the buzzing rascals go. Wild with fury, Uncle Fritz stamps and slashes them to bits. Oh, be joyful. All gone by is the May bug's deviltry. Uncle Fritz, his eyes can close. Once again in sweet repose. This was the bad boy's fifth trick. But the sixth will follow quick. Trick sixth. Easter days have come again, when the pious baker men bake all sorts of sugar things, plum cakes, ginger cakes, and rings. Max and Maurice feel an ache in their sweet tooth for some cake. But the baker thoughtfully locks his shop and takes his key. Who would steal, then? This must do. Wriggle down the chimney flue. Ratched! There come the boys, by Jiminy, Black as ravens, down the chimney. Puff! Into a chest they drop, Full of flour up to the top. Out they crawl from under cover, 
just as white as chalk all over. But the cracknels, precious treasure, on a shelf they spy with pleasure. Next the chair breaks, down they go, swap, into a trough of dough. All enveloped now in dough, see them, monuments of woe. In the baker comes and snickers, when he sees the sugar liquors. One, two, three, the brats behold, into two good brats are rolled. There's the oven, all red hot, shove em in, as quick as thought. Rough, out with em, from the heat, they are brown and good to eat. Now you think they've paid the debt, no, my friend, they're living yet. Nusper, nasper, like two mice, through their roofs, they gnaw in a trice. And the baker cries, you bet. There's the rascals living yet. This was the boy's sixth trick, but the last will follow quick. Max and Maurice, I grow sick when I think on your last trick. Why must these two scalawags cut those gashes in the bags? See the farmer on his back carries corn off in a sack. Scarce has he begun to travel, when the corn runs out like gravel. All at once he stops and cries, Darn it, I see where it lies. Ha! With what delighted eyes, Max and Maurice, he espies. Rabs, he opens wide his sack, shoves the rogues in. Huckapack! It grows warm with Max and Maurice, for to mill the farmer hurries. Master Miller, hello, man, grind me that as quick as you can. In with them, each wretched flopper headlong goes into the hopper. As the farmer turns his back, he hears the mill go creaky, cracky. Here you see the bits post-mortem, just as fate was pleased to sort em. Master Miller's ducks with speed gobbled up the coarse-grained feed. Conclusion In the village not a word, not a sign of grief was heard. Widow Tibbets, speaking low, said, I thought it would be so. None but self, cried Buck, to blame. Mischief is not life's true aim. Then said gravely Teacher Lample, There again is an example. To be sure, bad thing for youth, said the baker, a sweet tooth. Even uncle says, Good folks, see what comes of stupid jokes. But the honest farmer, Guy, what concern is that to I? Through the place, in short, there went one wide murmur of content. God be praised! The town is free from this great rascality. End of Max and Maurice A Juvenile History in Seven Tricks Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox.